How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune, by Orison Sweat Martin. Chapter 1. First, be a man. The great need at this hour is manly men. We want no goody-goody piety. We have too much of it. We want men who will do right, though the heavens fall, who believe in God, and who will confess Him. Rev. W. J. Dawson All the world cries, Where is the man who will save us? We want a man. Don't look so far for this man. You have him at hand. This man, it is you, it is I, it is each one of us. How to constitute oneself a man? Nothing harder if one knows not how to will it. Nothing easier if one wills it. Alexander Dumas I thank God I am a Baptist, said a little short doctor of divinity, as he mounted a step at a convention. Louder, louder, shouted a man in the audience. We can't hear. Get up higher, said another. I can't, replied the doctor. To be a Baptist is as high as one can get. But there is something higher than being a Baptist, and that is being a man. Rousseau says, according to the order of nature, men being equal, their common vocation is the profession of humanity, and whoever is well educated to discharge the duty of a man cannot be badly prepared to fill any of those offices that have a relation to him. It matters little to me whether my pupil be designed for the army, the pulpit, or the bar. To live is the profession I would teach him. When I have done with him, it is true he will be neither a soldier, a lawyer, nor a divine. Let him first be a man. Fortune may remove him from one rank to another. As she pleases, he will always be found in his place. First of all, replied the boy James A. Garfield, when asked what he meant to be. I must make myself a man. If I do not succeed in that, I can succeed in nothing. Hear me, O men, cried Diogenes in the marketplace at Athens. And when a crowd collected around him, he said scornfully, I called for men, not pygmies. One great need of the world today is for men and women who are good animals. To endure the strain of our concentrated civilization, the coming man and woman must have an excess of animal spirits. They must have a robustness of health. Mere absence of disease is not health. It is the overflowing fountain, not the one half full, that gives life and beauty to the valley below. Only he is healthy who exults in mere animal existence, whose very life is a luxury, who feels a bounding pulse throughout his body, who feels life in every limb, as dogs do when scouring over the field, or as boys do when gliding over fields of ice. Dispense with the doctor by being temperate, the lawyer by keeping out of debt, the demagogue by voting for honest men, and poverty by being industrious. Nephew, said Sir Godfrey Neller, the artist to a guinea slave trader, who entered the room where his uncle was talking with Alexander Pope. You have the honor of seeing the two greatest men in the world. I don't know how great men you may be, said the guinea man, as he looked contemptuously upon their diminutive physical proportions, but I don't like your looks. I have often bought a much better man than either of you, all muscles and bones, for ten guineas. A man is never so happy as when he suffices to himself and can walk without crutches or a guide. Said Jean-Paul Richter, I have made as much out of myself as could be made of the stuff, and no man should require more. The body of an athlete and the soul of a sage, wrote Voltaire to Helvetius, these are what we require to be happy. Although millions are out of employment in the United States, how difficult it is to find a thorough, reliable, self-dependent, industrious man or woman, young or old, for any position, 
whether as a domestic servant, an office boy, a teacher, a brakeman, a conductor, an engineer, a clerk, a bookkeeper, or whatever we may want. It is almost impossible to find a really competent person in any department, and oftentimes we have to make many trials before we can get a position fairly well filled. It is a superficial age. Very few prepare for their work. Of thousands of young women trying to get a living at typewriting, many are so ignorant, so deficient in the common rudiments even, that they spell badly, use bad grammar, and know scarcely anything of punctuation. In fact, they murder the English language. They can copy, parrot-like, and that is about all. The same superficiality is found in nearly all kinds of business. It is next to impossible to get a first-class mechanic. He has not learned his trade. He has picked it up and botches everything he touches, spoiling good material and wasting valuable time. In the professions, it is true, we find greater skill and faithfulness, but usually they have been developed at the expense of mental and moral breadth. The merely professional man is narrow. Worse than that, he is in a sense an artificial man, a creature of technicalities and specialties, removed alike from the broad truth of nature and from the healthy influence of human converse. In society, the most accomplished man of mere professional skill is often a nullity. He has sunk his personality and his dexterity. The aim of every man, said Humboldt, should be to secure the highest and most harmonious development of his powers to a complete and consistent whole. Some men impress us as immense possibilities. They seem to have a sweep of intellect that is grand, a penetrative power that is phenomenal. They seem to know everything, to have read everything, to have seen everything. Nothing seems to escape the keenness of their vision but somehow they are forever disappointing our expectations. They raise great hopes only to dash them. They are men of great promise, but they never pay. There is some indefinable want in their makeup. What the world needs is a clergyman who is broader than his pulpit, who does not look upon humanity with a white neckcloth ideal, and who would give the lie to the saying that the human race is divided into three classes, men, women, and ministers. Wanted, a clergyman who does not look upon his congregation from the standpoint of old theological books and dusty cobweb creeds, but who sees the merchant as in his store, the clerk as making sales, the lawyer pleading before the jury, the physician standing over the sickbed. In other words, who looks upon the great, throbbing, stirring, pulsing, competing, scheming, ambitious, impulsive, tempted mass of humanity as one of their number, who can live with them, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and experience their sensations. The world has a standing advertisement over the door of every profession, every occupation, every calling. Wanted a man. Wanted a lawyer who has not become the victim of his specialty, a mere walking bundle of precedence. Wanted a shopkeeper who does not discuss markets wherever he goes. A man should be so much larger than his calling, so broad and symmetrical in his culture, that he would not talk shop in society, that no one would suspect how he gets his living. Nothing is more apparent in this age of specialties than the dwarfing, crippling, mutilating influence of occupations or professions. Specialties facilitate commerce and promote efficiency in the professions, but are often narrowing to individuals. The spirit of the age tends to doom the lawyer to a narrow life of practice, the businessman to a mere money-making career. Think of a man, the grandest of God's creations, spending his lifetime standing beside a machine for making screws. There is nothing to call out his individuality, his ingenuity, his powers of balancing, judging, deciding. He stands there year after year until he seems but a piece of mechanism. His powers, from lack of use, dwindle to mediocrity, to inferiority, until finally he becomes a mere part of the machine he tends. 
wanted a man who will not lose his individuality in a crowd, a man who has the courage of his convictions, who is not afraid to say no, though all the world say yes. Wanted, a man who, though he is dominated by a mighty purpose, will not permit one great faculty to dwarf, cripple, warp, or mutilate his manhood, who will not allow the overdevelopment of one faculty to stunt or paralyze his other faculties. Wanted, a man who is larger than his calling, who considers it a low estimate of his occupation to value it merely as a means of getting a living. Wanted, a man who sees self-development, education and culture, discipline and drill, character and manhood in his occupation. As nature tries every way to induce us to obey her laws by rewarding their observance with health, pleasure and happiness, and punishes their violation by pain and disease, so she resorts to every means to induce us to expand and develop the great possibilities she has implanted within us. She nerves us to the struggle beneath which all great blessings are buried, and beguiles the tedious marches by holding up before us glittering prizes which we may almost touch, but never quite possess. She covers up her ends of discipline by trial, of character building through suffering, by throwing a splendor and glamour over the future. Lest the hard dry facts of the present dishearten us, and she fail in her great purpose. How else could nature call the youth away from all the charms that hang around young life, but by presenting to his imagination pictures of future bliss and greatness, which will haunt his dreams until he resolves to make them real? As a mother teaches her babe to walk by holding up a toy at a distance, not that the child may reach the toy, but that it may develop its muscles and strength, compared with which the toys are mere baubles. So nature goes before us through life, tempting us with higher and higher toys, but ever with one object in view, the development of the man. In every great painting of the masters there is one idea or figure which stands out boldly beyond everything else. Every other idea or figure on the canvas is subordinate to this idea or figure and finds its real significance not in itself, but pointing to the central idea finds its true expression there. So in the vast universe of God every object of creation is but a guideboard with an index finger pointing to the central figure of the created universe, man. Nature writes this thought upon every leaf. She thunders it in every creation. It exhales from every flower. It twinkles in every star. Open thy bosom, set thy wishes wide, and let in manhood. Let in happiness. Admit the boundless theater of thought from nothing up to God, which makes a man. Young. End of chapter 1 Recording by Pamela Krantz.